My name is Mian Hengjiang. I'm currently the president of Shanghai Branch Chinese Academy of Sciences. I'm also in charge of the TMSR project in China, uh, which is a pioneer initiative of Chinese Academy of Sciences. We have uh, roughly 50,000 staff and uh, employees, basically composed of researchers, professors, and technicians and so on and so forth. And at the same time, we also offer 50,000 graduate students PhD degrees and master degrees. And the Shanghai Institute of Applied Physics is focused on nuclear science and technology. And recently, the Academy of Sciences launched a pioneer initial program. It's called Thorium Melton Salt Reactor Project. 100% financed by our central government. China, as of today, is the second largest economy in the world. But however, China is still in the stage of its urbanization. As you can see from the chart, the urbanization rate of China is only 40-some percent. What in the U.S. is almost 99 percent, which means that China's economy is still in the stage of industrialization. If you can see from this chart, our GDP composition, the 45 to 50 percent of our economy is related to the industry. In terms of the energy per capita, China, if you compare with Japan and the U.S., U.S. is right here, and Japan is right here and per capita usage of the energy in China still way below what U.S. and Japan consumed. We are still in the stage of the urbanization at the ratio of 40-some percent. Here, that is the turning point. So from then on, the demand for the raw materials, for example, in this case, is copper, will turn to be a exponentially high requirement or demand, which we have to import from either Australia or Chile or someone else. So that gives us a energy security issue. We can only supply domestically that much energy, but we have a huge gap. We rely on outside China or we can develop ourselves if we can find a way to do that. The coal is still a major uh, energy for China and this is the oil and this is natural gas, and this is what we call renewable energy, including hydro, wind, and nuclear. How do we meet this gap? It's a huge challenge for China. To 2030, for U.S., the rely on the import of oil is, accounts for like 50% of their domestic demand. But China is going to be 75%. 75%, it's, it's, it's a scare, very scary number, right? And for the natural gas, U.S., by 2030, it's pretty much independent. But for the European countries, you also have an energy security issue. For oil, there's much higher dependence on the foreign import, and even for the gas. China, by 2030, we end up with the scenario that we will rely on a lot on foreign import of our energy. Another thing is about the climate change. So this is a picture of the Copenhagen Climate Summit. China made a commitment at that meeting that the unit GDP energy consumption will be reduced by 40 to 45 percent compared to 2005 level of China. The non-fossil energy accounts for 15% of primary energy by 2020, and currently is less than, if I remember correctly, 5%. This is a, another issue that people talk about, but all of a sudden, we don't hear that talk anymore. I don't know why, but China made a commitment anyway. So in about less than 10 years, our energy consumption intensity got to be reduced tremendously. So this is the Beijing look line when I grew up there 30 some years ago. And this is today. So that's why after 12 years in Beijing, I moved back to Shanghai. <laughs> Part of a reason. 
And if you look at the UK, this is today. So that's why we need to worry about our air pollution for our own sake, not quite for the IPCC report. Given the situation I just described, China is still in the industrialization processes, so those kind of scenario requires a high density energy. And to be honest, given the land size that we have, divided by the population, 1.4 billion, land is a scarce resource for China. So we need a high density energy. So that is why we need nuclear energy. Of course, China also is a rich solar country. Most of them in the west part of China, in that area, we have a lot desert, which growing nothing but sunshine. Probably we can turn that area into a, a solar factory. They've been talking about the AP1000 back in 2005. The technology was developed by Westinghouse, at that time a U.S. company, and later on changed the owner to Toshiba Japan. And when China and the Westinghouse was negotiating, was talking about the deployment of the AP-1000, there is no one in the U.S. deploy that technology. I was visiting the DOE at that time. I actually was asking a specific question. Why U.S. did not apply this technology in the U.S.? The answer was vigorous. But to the end, China actually signed a contract with Westinghouse in 2007. And recently, U.S. also approved another four units of AP-1000 in Georgia State. That's the new nuclear power station project ever been approved since three miles accident, so which is a good sign. As I said previously, China made a commitment by 2020, the renewable energy has to account for 15% of the primary energy. So how do we do that? I think one of the major action, now we talk about the action, the Chinese government has taken is to have a more nuclear power station installment in China. So by 2020, we are supposed to have a 70 gigawatts. Currently, we have a 10 gigawatts. And here, just in this single site, we'll have a six units of 1.25 gigawatts uh, nuclear power station. So then, the white Orient. I better leave this topic with the conference, but at least I think China has the second largest reserve. In addition to that, the nuclear fuel cycle, I quote this from a well-known paper here, I personally think that there is still an argument about whether thorium can be burned that clean. Again, I will leave this with the conference. And why MSR? This is the chart given by U.S. colleagues. The advantage of this is, this is clear. We not only have a, a low pressure here, which gives you more safety, we also end up with the high cool, cooling temperature here. And as far as energy is concerned, we need high temperature. Because nuclear power station not only generate electricity, but we also can take advantage of the high temperature. If you can go as high as 900 degrees C or even higher, then we can use this energy to produce the hydrogen. Once we have the hydrogen, then we can convert the CO2, which is not the waste at all. It's a raw material for our chemicals, in fact, if we can collect them. But we need the high temperature. In general, we need the energy to convert them. So that's what we call the hybrid energy system. We've already done many pilot projects, and some of them are already industrialized. For example, the coal to liquid fuel project, those are not just a pilot plant, it's an industrialized scale. And the technology and the catalysts are all developed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Once we have the electricity generated by the nuclear power station, which is clean, then we hope that we can drive the car by electricity. I'm sure some of you have already seen this. In 1994, the state of California passed the law of the zero emissions. And GM's EV1 came out in 1996 because they want very much like to catch the market of the California. But 
the big oils heavily lobbying East Coast, especially the New England area, not to follow the same track as California did. The big oil was successfully doing that. So finally, GM called back all the EV1s from the market and crashed them in 2004. It's, it's something to me like World War II, NAS. It's amazing, it's, it's a very scary story here. And what happened in China? We used to have a dream, if we can produce a clean electricity, then we can drive our electrical car. Here is the total carbon fiber EV. It's a pure electrical car developed by Chinese Academy of Sciences. However, if you look at this, as of today, the capacity of the production capability in China is over that of the United States. We have a 20 million units production capacity. So the gasoline car here in China is everywhere. So it makes it even impossible to convert the gasoline car into the electrical car. So we also have our big oils here and our all GMs here. How do we overcome the obstacle in front of us in order to push the green economy we need something revolutionary to happen even in this part of the world. We have a dream, even the economy is globalized, but each country has its own security issue. So we very much like to be a energy independent. Use nuclear or even solar to produce the electricity that we need. Then we can save the coal used for the production of electricity to convert the coal into the chemicals that meet our normal needs. Then we can say the oil we have to import. So that gave us a possibility of the energy independence. And then we'll also at the same time give rise to a green economy and create a lot of new kind of jobs. For example, if we can convert all the gasoline car into a EV cars. The cover of the car not to use stainless steel but carbon fibers. Then we can reduce tremendously the quantity of the input of the raw materials. And another driving force will be high speed train. If we can build up a network of the high speed train nationwide, I mean this kind of transition can in fact change the structure of the economy and at the same time will create more jobs for sure we need that and i wish the conference will give a good answer and solutions to the question why thorium and why molten salt reactor i wish the conference a real success thank you